Very good. I apologize for that delay. Good morning again. Um, as I wasn't here um, earlier, I don't know what y'all have prayed for this morning, um, but as of last night, um, my wife called me and let me know that they had to evacuate uh, at Eden Valley. Um, they, the fire's getting too close there in Colorado. So um, <clears throat> nobody's in danger, and as far as I know, the property is, is not yet uh, either. But we want to continue to lift them up in prayer um, because you know how, how quickly things can happen with those wild, wildfires and unpredictably, and all of a sudden it's across a road or over a mountain or whatever. Um, so anyway, I'm thankful she had a place to go. Um, you know that uh, she is affiliated with Wellness Secrets and uh, a gentleman by the name of Wes um, owns or, or is the founder of Wellness Secrets and he has a daughter that lives there in Colorado relatively near Eden Valley and Rhonda is staying with his daughter. So I'm, I'm happy about that. I guess every, most everyone else was put up in hotels and so forth. So everyone did get out safely and have a place to be. And um, that's about all I know at this point. Um, we'll, we'll wait and see what transpires from there. But this morning, here we are. And I think that's a good thing, don't you? That we are all here gathered together. Again, I, I don't know. I just don't know how long we're going to get to keep meeting unabated. Um, where, where we get to come together freely and, and not have harassment from the government or, or li under, otherwise. It's a real privilege, and, and we need to appreciate what God has granted us here this morning. Let's have a prayer, and I'm going to delve right into today's message. Father, I, I thank you for our opportunity to gather here this morning. Surely you have smiled on us and given us this opportunity. You're the one who chose to wake us up with breath in our lungs. You're the one who has kept this church open and uh, functioning. And Lord, uh, we just appreciate this opportunity to come apart from all the things that otherwise keep us busy or burden us or distract us. And just take this time to connect with you, to listen to your word, to, to, to connect with other like-minded believers and to be encouraged in the faith. And I pray that you will do according to your good and perfect will in this place. We want you to be in charge here today, Father. And we want you to be honored and glorified. We want everyone else here to be uh, encouraged and edified. And we ask for your blessing in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. So, um, you know that Jesus has a, a method of, of teaching. What is that method that he often employs? Parables. parables, that's right. And what is a parable? Story. Parable is a story, a story with a lesson in it, right? Jesus would use common things, known things, and, and then tie, a, a, weave a spiritual lesson into it so that people could relate and connect and, and understand what he was talking about. And so uh, today I want to talk to you about a specific parable. Um, it is the, the parable of the workers in the vineyard that is found in Matthew chapter 20. If you brought your Bible today, could you say amen? amen. Very good. Open them with me to the gospel of Matthew chapter 20. The specific parable that we're going to be looking at today um, is found only in Matthew. It is not in the other gospels. So um, we're going to look at this one in Matthew chapter 20. And I should say that it is, you know that chapters and verses and all of that stuff, that came later. Um, it wasn't originally a part of how the scripture was written. It wasn't broken up like that, right? So anyway, there's this division between, of course, chapter 19 and chapter 20. And in that, with that division, we need to be mindful of the fact that actually it flowed into the next chapter. So 
he's building on some things that he was saying in chapter 19. In chapter 19, you have the story of the rich young ruler. And one of the things that ends up with, after the story of the rich young ruler, is that there is a, a summation of his point. And it's found in the very last verse of, of uh, chapter 19. That would be verse 30. So I'm just going to take a look at that really quickly. Verse 30 of chapter 19 in Matthew. And it says, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Okay, so he just had made that point and now he is going on to illustrate that point with this parable. Okay, and the parable that we're looking at again is the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And that is in Matthew chapter 20 where we're going to begin in verse 1. What we're going to do today is as we read along, we're going to kind of take a look at each verse or a couple of verses and take time to talk about them for a second and see what each verse means and how it applies. Okay, so beginning in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 1, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. So I want to stop right there and talk about that for a second. <clears throat> Very often when Jesus was teaching, he would start with the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like, right? The kingdom of heaven is like. So there's a couple of things that I want to say about the kingdom of heaven. First of all, you realize that Jesus was trying to get people to understand. In fact, he said very plainly many times, my kingdom is not of this world. Amen. Right? So it's, it's not like what you're familiar with. What you've been experiencing and, and the ways and the rules and the interactions and all that, it's, it's not like that. Let me tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. So he says the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. And in this case, the landowner is referring, can you, can you guess to whom? That would be God. And the landowner, it says again, looking back at verse 1, he went out early in the morning to hire laborers for what? His vineyard. So what would be the, the vineyard in this case? Okay, so, so you've got the world. You've got God and you've got the, the world. And, and he wants laborers to go into his vineyard, right? What would the laborers do in a vineyard? Okay, they would prune it and take care of it. And they would, in this case, be gathering a harvest. So which would tie into what you're saying. Okay, how that, how that harvest is gathered. It, it's about, so if the, if the vineyard is the world and the work is gathering a harvest, what does that actually mean then? I, I, it's not a trick question. If, if the vineyard is, is a world and, and the workers are sent into the vineyard to work and the work is harvesting, what does that mean in real terms? Yeah. God wants workers to reach out to people and win them to Christ. Is that, is that accurate? Does that sound right to you? Can you understand? Okay, so we're on the same page. Okay, now we're going to move along to verse 2. Okay, in verse 2, it says, Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And first of all, I want to just address this agreed with the laborers. Remember, he went into the marketplace to find some laborers, right? He went out early to get some laborers. And it says that he agreed with the laborers. What does this mean? They agreed on their wages, okay? Because what was common in those days is the, mer the potential workers would gather in the marketplace and someone co would come along and say, hey, I'd like you to work with me, and then they'd strike a bargain. I'll work with, you know, for you for this much. And so they agreed, and he agreed with the laborers. They had an agreement. You'll work for me, for, and each day that you work for me, it'll be a denarius, Right? If you have a King James Version, it says a what? 
a penny. Man, was he like a tightwad? A penny? Look, what, what it is, is it, he was not at all a tightwad. A denarius was the average price that you would pay for a um, day's work. That's what a denarius was. So it wouldn't be like, you know, he, he's throwing around chump change. He's, he's paying him an honest day's wage. Okay? And that's what they agreed to. So he agreed with the laborers that they would come and work for him for a denarius, a day's wages. By the way, he went out early in the morning, right? Notice that in verse, um, let's see, verse number, uh, let's see, I think I'm ahead. Yeah, that's three through five. Let's go, let's read those together. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. Now, first of all, he went out early, but now he's going out again about the third hour. Anybody have any idea what time it might be? Nine o'clock in the morning. So first he went out early, but like probably around six, got some early workers, right? They agreed to work for him for the day, for a day's wages. Now he's going out about nine o'clock, and it says, um, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. If the third hour is nine o'clock, then the sixth hour is noon. And then the ninth hour is three. Very good. Very good. Okay. So it says that when he got to the marketplace to get these workers, that they were standing how? Idle. What does that mean? Okay, they're not making any money. That's true. What else? They're not doing any work. They're not doing anything. They're just standing around. Standing idle in the marketplace. And he goes and commissions them, doesn't he? Notice that he said about their wage, whatever is right, I will give you. Now, in the, with the early workers, it says he agreed with them for a denarius. But with these, he said, whatever's right, I'll give you. And they went. There was no bargaining that was struck. They just trusted that, okay, you will do what is right. And we're glad to have work and we're coming. Right? So... Now, let's proceed in this parable to verse 7. In verse 7, it says, oh, I'm sorry. I need to read verses 6 and 7. And about the 11th hour, he, by the way, what time is the 11th hour? 5 o'clock. Okay. When you think about the work day, what kind of work were they doing again? Harvesting grapes. So daylight is pretty important, right? Okay, and they're, it's 5 o'clock and he's going to the marketplace and it says, uh, so about the 11th hour he went out and found others again standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one hired us. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. Okay, so let's talk about this for a second. The 11th hour then would be like 5 o'clock. So think about this. The first people that he went out and got, he got about 6 a.m. They agreed to work for a day's wages. Then he went out again at 9 a.m., got some more workers. Whatever's right, I'll pay you. Then he went out again at noon, got some more. Whatever's right, I'll pay you. Then he went out again at 3 and got some more. Whatever's right, I'll pay you. Then he goes out again at the end of the day at 5. Says, you come work too. Whatever's right, I'll pay you. All right. So that's where we're at. And they were also standing idle. Again, not engaged in meaningful work. Not engaged in anything that was going to afford them a reward. So the reason that they gave for standing idle all day was what? Nobody hired. No one hired us. 
It's not that we're unwilling to work. Nobody hired us. Okay, so then they go and again, it's agreed whatever's right. That's what you're going to receive. So that's the parable that he lays out. Now let's, let's move along a little bit and see a little further into it. In verse 8 it says, So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. Now this is interesting. Let's, let's consider what these things mean. First of all, call the laborers. See, it wasn't like, okay, it's 5.30, we punch out now. No, you keep working until the guy comes out and says, okay, guys, let's bring it in. It's time to call it a night. Right? So, so it is with us. We are to continue our work until God makes it clear that our work is done. Amen. Okay? So anyways, call them in so we can give them wages. You see, that first group, they agreed to a certain wage, didn't they? And there was an expected reward for everyone. They all knew they'd get something. For, for many, it was told, whatever is right, that's what I'll give you, right? But they all knew that they were going to get something. That's why they were engaged in the work. They knew they had a part in something that was going to result in a reward. What's interesting is that it, this was not common. He said, when you're giving out the wages, start with the last and then go to the first. Right? Now, that's, that's an unusual way of doing things. That the people who came in at 5 o'clock and worked until 6... They're the ones who got paid first, while those who worked longer waited and saw what was transpiring and so forth, right? Well, let's read on. In verse 9, it says, and when those, excuse me, and when those came who were hired about the 11th hour, they each received how much? A denarius. They all got, wait, how much did we say that denarius is? What is a day's wages. And, and they worked, how long? One hour. So they worked one hour, but they got paid like they worked all day long. Okay? So now, let's go ahead and read verse 10. It says, but when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. Okay. So first they started with the people who came at 5. Now, now we're going to deal with the people who came at 6 a.m. Okay. At six, the people who came at 6 a.m., they thought that they were going to receive more. Why did they think that they were going to receive more? Yeah, they worked a lot longer. Well, these guys who only worked one hour, they got a full day's pay. So, you know, we've been out here all day. I'm sure we're going to get more. Right? So then they got paid what? That's exactly right. They got paid a denarius, a full day's wage. So let's read on. In verses 11 and 12, it says, And when they had received it, they did what? They complained. they complained, they grumbled, they murmured against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. They had a problem with how things were being divvied up here. So they complained because you realize that you complain when you perceive an injustice. You complain when you think something is not right here. Right? And so that's what's going on. What, what do they think is unjust? Well, you made them equal with us. They get the same thing as we get. That's the problem, right? 
Why is that a problem? Well, you've only been at it one hour, Eric. I've been at it all day. I've been, I had a 12-hour work day. How should you get the same reward as I get? Right? In the burden and the heat, the scorching heat, working all day long. So their problem is that they perceive that the employer, the landowner, is being unfair to them. Unfair to them. Now let's read the remainder of the chapter, or actually the remainder of the parable, beginning in verse 13. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called but few chosen. Okay, now let's talk about this a little bit. Okay, first of all, he just got done being addressed by people who were, how were they addressing him? They, they were complaining. They were upset. They didn't think he was doing what was right. Right? And the way that he responds is, friend, I like that because that is, that is winsome, isn't it? It's inclusive. It's, it's hey, let's, let's reason together. Friend, he addresses them. And then he says, basically, I haven't done anything wrong to you. You got exactly what we agreed to. Right? How is that wrong? You agreed to work for a denarius, and I'm paying you a denarius. How is that wrong? And then he says about what I wish to give. Isn't it lawful for me to do what I wish to give with my own things? You know, can I do that? It's interesting. Some people in this room have been walking with and working for God for many years. Many years. Oh, so many years. <laughs> I kid, I kid. But what, what I want to say is that those of you who have been walking with God and working with God for so many years, you have entered into it in a knowing covenant with God that as I walk with you and work with you, you will continue to work in me and ultimately I get a reward that is beyond what I deserve, right? I, I get to have eternal life and I get the inheritance of Jesus, right? Now, the thing is, we shouldn't compare ourselves to other people. Let me say that again. We shouldn't compare ourselves to other people. Have you ever looked at somebody and you think, well, you know, why, why is that guy so blessed? You know, I mean, I'm over here making all these sacrifices and I've been at it for a long time, let me tell you. And why, why should this guy, I mean, I don't get it, man. Well, there's something that you need to understand. God's ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. He is not comparing you to them. Neither should you. Right? What he is offering, whether you have been at it for a long time or you're only just beginning, is way beyond anything you could ever deserve. So he asks the question. He says, is your eye evil because I am good? What does this mean? 
What does this mean? Is your eye evil because I'm good? I think that he is challenging the perception, right? You, you perceive an injustice that I'm doing you an injustice. Is my goodness to this person doing wrong to you? Because I am blessing this person and graciously dealing with them far beyond what they, they deserve, is that a slight to you? Am I doing something wrong to you because I'm blessing this person? And, and no, the answer is obviously no, right? If you get blessed, Mavis, in, in a way that God just opens up the doors of heaven and, and just pours out a, a blessing that you can't contain, should I think, you know, hey, that's not fair. Aren't, aren't I the pastor? Shouldn't I get blessed? You see the error in the thinking there, right? So if our eye is evil, they, what he's challenging on is, is you don't see things as they really are. Because you're, the way that you're looking at things is somehow you've earned a right to more. But do we earn our salvation? Do we earn the inheritance of Jesus? Do we earn eternal life? Is there anything that we can do to, to deserve it? No. Oh. And when we begin to compare ourselves to others and think that somehow we're on a higher plateau, man, that's big trouble. And that's what Jesus is trying to correct here. This is why Jesus goes to the, the point of, of, and we're going to go to this, last being first. When he's paying them, he pays the 11th hour people first. Now, if he would have paid the, the first workers first, they would have got their pay and went away happy because they got exactly what they expected. There would have been no issue. But Jesus, the, the landowner in the parable, wanted to set it up so that the people who came early and they were the first workers would see how he dealt with the last workers. How very generous and gracious he was. He wanted them to witness it. And then they felt slighted because they got the equal treatment. Why does Jesus want people who were the early workers to see him deal so graciously with the late workers? Why is that? He wanted, he wanted to see the response. Yeah, they were they were thought different. They were hated up. Okay. So what what Jesus wants is to challenge the thinking of the first workers. Do not think that somehow, because you have walked with me long, you are more deserving of my grace than someone who has only walked with me a very short time. The work that you have done with God, being a part of his ministry, listen to me, the work that you have done with God over many long years has been your privilege to be a part of. Do you understand that? Your long hours in the night praying for some wayward soul, your, your hard fruits, uh, your, I mean your hard cultivating of the soil, trying to reach out and work and do everything that you can to meet someone, that is a privilege to work with God in meeting people and, and trying to connect with them and trying to help them. Listen, y'all know it's filled with heartache trying to win souls, right? It's, it's, there's struggles there because people are not always receptive. You know that. How many people are in church today? Anybody do the count? 33 downstairs? Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, a lot of them are in Springfield. Let's say... Pre-COVID conditions, on a good day, we get 100 people here, okay? On a good day, right? Let's say, let's think about this for a second. 
in Joplin, city limits. How many, what's the population? 50,000 50, and, and change. So 50,000. Now, if I had 100 out of 1,000, that would be 1%. 10%. Am I right? 10%. 10%, excuse me. So if I had 100 out of 10,000, that would be 1%. So then what if I had 100 out of 50,000? How much is that? 0 0.05. 0 0.05%. Wow. 0 0.05? Is that correct? Is that math correct? Is that like a half a percent? No, it's not. 0. 0.5 is a half a percent. 0. 0.05, that's real low, right? So what I'm saying is that how many, how big of a percentage of, of uh, people are a part of and connected to this, this Seventh-day Adventist church here in Joplin compared to just the people in Joplin that are residents. 0.05%. Which is actually a generous number because everyone here doesn't live in Joplin. Right? So having said that, what I'm saying is that when we take the application of this parable and we consider what does it look like in our lives if we are the workers who have been hired to work in his vineyard the portion of the Lord's vineyard that we are responsible to work in is is this area right the area in which we live and would you agree I, I don't know what you think but what I think is that reaching 0.05% of this community is not the number that the Lord has in mind. Hmm. What would it take to just double that? Because we're talking about, if it's, if, if it's 100 out of, out of 50,000, then it would be, what, 10 out of 5,000? Is that right? Is that the same per, uh, ratio? 100 out of 50,000 is equal to 10 out of 5,000? Do you follow my math? You just drop a zero? Okay. So 10 people out of 5,000 in Joplin then would be, if we counted all of us, 10 people out of 5,000 would be believers, Adventists that have bought into the, the message and taken on uh, being a part of the mission. Consider a group of 5,000 people. Have you ever been to a gathering of over 1,000 people? Uh-huh. 5,000 is a pretty good number of people, right? There's a lot there. Do you think there's a chance that out of 5,000 people out here in Joplin, we might find 10 who would say, you know, I, I think that you guys are beginning to understand what is true and right. And I, I, I have similar beliefs. I, I, I believe what the Bible is, is teaching there. And I think that I should also be involved and connected. Is there, is there a potential that out of 5,000 people, we might find 10? I think so. So then out of 50,000 people, it would make sense that we would find 100 more. So, we have been called to be workers. Here's, here's another thing I want to challenge you with this morning. 
How, how many of you have been walking with and, and working with the Lord for, uh, let, let me start high. You've been walking with and working with the Lord for 20 years. Can I see your hands? Just raise your hand. Good, good. 30? Wow. Excellent. 40? Wow. Anybody 50? 50? Amazing. How about you've been over 50 years, you've been walking with the Lord? Yeah. That's, that's pretty fantastic. Do you know those of you who have been working long and faithfully, who have prayed thousands upon thousands of prayers, who through blood and sweat and tears have pressed on in the upward way, do you know that it is not time to stop working yet? He has not sent someone out to say, it's time to come in, guys. Those of you who have just recently come into the work of the Lord, listen, we're not to compare ourselves to anyone. Whether you've been at it for a long time or a short time, don't compare yourselves to anyone. Amen. Just look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, right? Take up the work that he has given you to do. Well, what work has he given us to do? I, I feel like, I mean, we've tried this, we've tried that, and now we're under the things of, of COVID. And I, I, you know, I feel like there's nothing else we can do. So we're just where we are. This, this is it, right? This is it. This is all God expects to happen in, in, in and through the Joplin Seventh-day Adventist Church. I don't think so either. Is this all, all the people that, that God wants to be a part of his last day movement to prepare a people who are ready for the soon return of Jesus? No. Do we exist for the sole purpose of just kind of encouraging each other and it kind of inward, you know, let's, let's try to make sure that just at least we all make it. Is that our purpose? Is that our mission? No, our mission is the same as Jesus's, right? To seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. So, having said all that, I want to say something that has been said to you before. But I want you to think about it individually first. In other words, think about it in terms of just your own self. Not your family, not your church, you, okay? Consider this. This is a truth. If you keep doing what you've been doing, you will keep getting what you've been getting. That's true. Amen. If you keep doing what you've been doing, you will keep getting what you've been getting. Now think about this. Have I been involved in ministry which has won some soul to the Lord? If not, what do I need to do differently? How can I get myself involved with some ministry that wins some soul to the Lord? Because I'm going to tell you something. Sheep beget sheep. The shepherd does not produce sheep. He guides them. It's the sheep that beget sheep. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let me ask you a question. What would happen if each one reached one? What would happen if, if you won one soul 
to the Lord. Just one. Well, I'm going to tell you a couple things that would happen. Our church would double in attendance. It would double in resources. It would double in, it would more than double in its ability to minister because of the collaborative dynamic that is, uh, what do they call it? Uh, ah, synergy. You know, where one plus one doesn't just equal two. You got two people working instead of just one and you get three times as much done. So when you think about you, what have I been doing and how has it been producing? If I keep doing what I've been doing, I can expect to keep getting what I've been getting. How could I change things up so that I get more than what I've been getting? My, my labor is more fruitful. Wouldn't you like to be more fruitful? I know I would. Listen, it is, it is uh, tempting to think that if, if you maintain the status quo, you're doing okay. I don't think that's how God thinks about things. I think that God is wanting to do something greater than what we have experienced. I mean, I don't just think that. I believe it with all of my heart. What do you think? Do you think he wants to do more than he has done here so far? Amen. Is it possible that God wants to do more of a transformative work in you, Jerry, than has already been accomplished? Is it possible that he would like to win more people through you than you have already been engaged with? It's not only possible, I think it's a sure thing that God definitely wants to do more of a transformative work in me and he wants to use me more effectively than he has so far. Yes. And I think that's true for you. Would you agree with that? Do you think that's accurate? Yes. I see a couple nodding. I, I'm really asking the question, do you think that's accurate? Do you think that God wants to do more in you than he's already done and more through you than has already happened? Do you think that? So do I. So how does that occur? What does that look like? How do we take that from an, uh, an ideal and put it into application so that it becomes experience? How do we move from where we are today to being a more vibrant, lively, fruitful movement of God. How does that happen? Amen. Amen. So Jess's answer, and I want to say that I heartily agree with you that his answer is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit has to happen. How does the outpouring of the Holy Spirit take place? We have to want it for one thing. They waited around for it. Okay. They wanted it so bad. They didn't just get it. Okay. It, it wasn't just like they were just going about their normal status quo activities and all of a sudden, boom, they were hit with the Holy Spirit. Ask and you shall receive. So putting that into simple terms, what we're talking about is, is really praying and seeking, yeah. right? We, can, we should expect, how, how much should we expect of the, of the miraculous work of God that does not begin with prayer? How much should we expect? Nothing. Nothing. We are needing a new commitment to prayer to ask God to pour out upon us yes. his spirit. Because I'm going to tell you something. If Jesus came today in this moment, 
Let, let me just put it this way. I'm just going to be transparent. If Jesus came in this moment, I think I might have the sense of, oh, wait, give me another, hold on, I, maybe I'm not just ready. What does that say to me? Man, that tells me that I need to be on my knees more praying for just so that I know that I am not only washed in the blood, but filled with the Spirit of God and ready to receive Him as He's ready to receive me. Do you feel ready for that moment? Do you feel like when, when He's... <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm going to take one more liberty. Because I've thought about standing before God and him asking me questions. And, you know, the worst thing that I can imagine God saying to me, the, the, the worst thing that I can imagine would be, depart from me. I, I don't know you. But beyond that, I've thought further than that. I, and I've thought, uh, what would be maybe the next worst thing I could think of God saying to me? And you know, I, I can't imagine him going, where is your flock? Jeff, wh where is your flock? You had all these people in your flock, where are they? And I'll tell you something. I don't know how to win them. I don't know how to save them. I don't know how to make sure that it all happens. What I do know how to do is take myself to the Lord and say, I don't know how to come in or go out. And I need you to give me wisdom. And I need you to fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can manifest good fruits so that others can taste and see that you are good. And I pray, Lord, that you will in your, through the power of your spirit, show me how I am supposed to apply myself just now. That's thinking about things kind of individually. How about collectively? What does God want to do in this church? If God could do something in this church that we through faith believed he could do and therefore received it, do you know it would be no less profound than somebody who was seen to receive a healing that they, they didn't used to be able to walk, but now they can walk. That person used to be wild and out of control, breaking chains and tormenting people because they were possessed with demons. Now they're in their right mind. Amen. You see, I think that God would do something in our church that would be noticeable. That you could actually perceive, wow, God is at work in that church. And then God would do something through that church. Amen. This church. Not this building. This group of believers. That's what I think. I really think that. If, if you think I'm out in left field, can you tell me why? Am I out in left field or do you think, if you think that I'm at least close to thinking right on this, could you say amen? amen. So then what do we do? How do we begin a new season of prayer that looks different from what we've been engaged with? How do we open up ourselves more completely so that God can work in us in, in a way that allows him to transform our character, change the way that we think, bring about characteristics that didn't exist there before? 
I used to be an angry man, but, but now I'm a peaceful man. I, I used to be an impatient man, but now I'm long-suffering. I, you know what I'm saying? Do we... I'm, I'm going to push the envelope here. Do we stop here and, and we say, yeah, that, that's a real good point. That's, that's sure right. We all do got to pray. Boy, if things are going to be different, God's going to have to do something. Yes, sir. And we all leave here and we all continue about our lives as we always do. And we come back to to worship and, and to hear another sermon and be encouraged. But nothing's really changed. Look, there's a reason I'm pushing the envelope. Please forgive me if I'm being at all clumsy with it because I, I don't mean to be offensive at all. Rather, I would like to challenge us all. We cannot accept what, is, what we've come to know as status quo. That's not all there is. That's not all God has for us. That's not what we were created for and raised up for. It's, there's more. And the hour, the hour I believe is getting late. Do you think that Jesus might return sometime soon? So if it's the end of the day and there needs to be more workers, how are those workers going to come? Won't we be a part of winning them? Isn't that how that works? I mean, God does the calling actually, but it's interesting how he chooses to use you and I. Look, what I know what I'm convicted of, I should say, what I'm convicted of is that there is something that somehow I, I don't know what the block is yet of how we haven't opened ourselves to the true flowing and moving of the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us. And I'm not pointing fingers, and, and you all can point fingers if you want. All I know is that we need more of what we don't have yet. Is, is that a fair statement? Can, can we just maybe start with, with a prayer here together today? And, and I, I want to ask you too. I want to ask you to do something that's different. I would like to ask you to pray that the Lord will help us to find a collective wisdom so that we know what he wants us to do yes. as a church to reach out to our community, 50,000 people that are out there, just in Joplin. And the Lord loves every last one of them. Amen. There's no way you could put a value on one soul. I want to ask you to pray that the Lord will give us a collective wisdom of at least one thing that we can do to reach people in our community Amen. that will be fruitful. By this my Father is glorified, that you do what? Bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. Will you, and I'm, I'm going to take my time with this, will you, in the next two weeks, pray that God will give us, give us a collective wisdom that we might begin to understand the next step that he wants us to take to reach our community. Will you do that? If you will, will you raise your hand? Hold it up. 
If you will really do that, I want to see you raise your hand. Good. Good, good, good. God answers the prayers of his people, right? Amen. Pray for the Holy Spirit's outpouring on us. Pray for wisdom and pray that we will have a united consensus idea of how we should reach our community. Because he knows. He has a plan that he wants to invite us to be a part of. So, I'm not exactly sure how it came across to you today in this, this message that I've delivered. I feel like I've been a little bit clumsy, like maybe I've kind of staggered around here and there. But I, I know something. If we will seek the Lord together wholeheartedly, he will pour his spirit out on us. Amen. And if he pours his spirit out on us, noticeable changes will take place, including fruitfulness yeah. in a harvest. That I know. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, I'm not exactly sure where to start this prayer, so I'm just going to start with, with you. Lord, you are good. And I know that you love each one of us with an everlasting love. Amen. And I know that you plan to equip us for everything that you've called us to do. You have said that your biddings are your enablings. And when you have commissioned us to be a part of your work, to be co-laborers together with you, it is because you intend to fill us with your Holy Spirit and then, Lord, to help us to have the kinds of connections with people that will produce fruit. Yes. And I just want to ask you this morning for, for a couple of things. First of all, would you please forgive us, Lord? I pray that you will forgive us for the ways that we have failed you and fallen short. I pray that you'll forgive us for standing by idle. I, I pray, Lord, that you will um, forgive us for, you know, instead of manifesting your character, manifesting a carnal nature. Um, I, I pray, Father, that you will forgive us for our lack of faith in thinking that Somehow you can't do things that are better than we've already experienced. I pray, Father, that you will now do a work of renewal in each one of us. That not only will you cleanse us from our unrighteousness, but that you will stand us up and that you will cause us to walk in paths of righteousness. Lord, that you will shore up our steps, that you will put your arm around us, yoke us up with you, help us to be engaged in the work that you have for us. And I pray that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit in such a way that it is a pronounced change, a undeniable transformation that takes place in our character so that all of our motives, our love, and that which we do is out of faith and obedience. We need your help with this, Lord, so much. I believe you want us to reach a great number of people here in Joplin and in the surrounding communities. I know that you must first do a work in us and I pray that you will help us to stop resisting you. Whatever is in the way, Lord, whatever is in the way of the free-flowing work of your spirit, we want to lay that down at the altar. We want to give you permission to work in us so that we can be fit to have you work through us. Please, Lord, do something that is beyond what we have imagined. Help us to be opened up to what you want to do 
give us a united mission that we all understand and that we can take action steps to engage in. We need your leadership. We need the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. I ask for it in the name of Jesus.
So trusting my all unto thy care, I know thou lovest me. I'll do thy will.